QuickBooks Pro Desktop 2021 Sales Receipt Payment Received at Point of Sale. Let's get into it with Intuit's QuickBooks Pro Desktop 2021. Here we are in our Geek Ray Guitars Practice File homepage. We currently have the open windows open. You can open the open windows by going to the view drop down and selecting the open windows list. We're now going to be taking a look at the create sales receipt. So the create sales receipt is going to be similar to the invoice, have a similar layout as an invoice. However, the invoice is going to be created when we make a sale on account. In other words, we did the work and now we're basically billing the client or charging the client for the work and expect to receive payment some point in the future. Whereas the create sales receipt is going to be a form that will be used when we're, when we're receiving the payment at the same point in time that we did the work. So you can kind of think of the create sales receipt as like a receipt that you would be processing if you were to make a sale in real time at the cash register in a store or something like that. So let's go up top and let's look at our reports. And let's go to the company and financial. Let's go on down to the balance sheet report. And let's change the dates in the custom date range. So custom date range. Changing the dates from 01, 01, 21 to 12, 31, 21. January through December 2021 and OK. Let's do the same for the income statement or P&L, profit and loss reports drop down. Go into the company and financial profit and loss report. Changing the date range from... 010121 to 123121 January through December here's what we have there thus far let's go through our practice of first thinking about the financial statements what's going to happen to the financial statements when we create a sales receipt then we'll create the sales receipt then we'll see what happened to the financial statement and if it lined up to what we thought would happen when we create a sales receipt that means that we made a sale at the same point in time so you can think of it like in a store in our case we're selling guitars you can imagine ourselves in the guitar store with a cash register someone brought the guitar up and we're selling it to them at that point in time ringing it up in the cash register processing a sales receipt sales receipt being the type of form we're talking about at this point so that means that if we got paid at that point in time if it was a cash payment then the cash would be going up we're going to increase cash in some way shape or form however uh, we're typically not going to put it into cash itself or the checking account, but rather into undeposited funds, as is our default. And this will be very important if you do actually make cash sales, because the cash sales that you will be picking up are not in the same format that they will be deposited into the bank as. And therefore, this undeposited fund will be useful so that we can group those deposits in the relevant deposit formats they need to be so that the bank statement will reflect the same grouping of deposits as our financial statements will, so we can do the bank reconciliation comparing our books to the banks as easily as possible. So the, so the undeposited funds will be going up. The other side of that will typically be on the sales. The rest of this will look a lot like an invoice, right? There's, the other side will be on sales, and so sales will be increasing. However, the sales will be increasing by only the sales price, not the amount of money that we got, which will be the sales price plus, plus the sales tax, meaning sales tax is not included in sales. Why? Because we didn't really charge the sales tax in theory. The government charged the sales tax to the customer and they just made us their collection agency. So we're just collecting it for them. And so we're going to go back to the balance sheet. Where's that recorded then? It's a liability. It's going to be in the sales tax payable, which we're going to have to accumulate upwards through in our process the month of January and then we'll have to pay it to the government decrease in the liability at that point in time in the month of February we'll, we'll pay off January's payments in the month of February okay second thing that's going to happen just like an invoice inventory is going to be going down for the cost of the of the inventory it won't be on the sales receipt just like it's not on the invoice because we might provide the sales receipt to the customer and therefore we don't want our costs on it but the sales receipt will drive the inventory going down it'll do that with the use of the items that we set up in a prior presentation and then if i go to the profit and loss we will have cost of goods sold which will be the reflection of the expense of us consuming uh the 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 inventory on, on the income statement side of things and then going back to the balance sheet we also know that the inventory sub account will be will be uh, reflecting the fact that we sold a guitar, which is what we sell for inventory. Let's check it out. So we're going to go to the home tab. We're going to go to the create sales receipt. Now also note where it is in the flow chart. If, if we were to do the invoice, we'd have the invoice, which would increase the accounts receivable, record the sales, 
then we would receive a payment increasing undeposited funds decreasing accounts receivable these two and then if we were to create the sales receipt it's just like we're skipping those first two steps right it would be just like we created an invoice and then recorded the received payment we don't need those two forms we just need one form because we got the payment right at that point in time so we would be at the same point here as you can see in the flow chart as we would as if we had an invoice and then the receive payment because we're getting the payment at the same point all right let's go into the create sales receipt so create sales receipt form and i'm gonna i'm gonna close this window to the right just to give us some more space i'm gonna say this is gonna go to string uh, music so i don't think i have that so i'm gonna type in string music this is going to be a new customer you could say add customer or just type it in there and then say tab it's going to ask you if you want to add it we do in practice we probably would want to add all the detail for the customer but here just want the quick add so that we can fill out the customer receipt because we've seen the customer form before then whatever the payment type will be i'm going to say cash notice that if you're getting something like cash then you're going to want to probably use that undeposited funds to group the cash together and then put it into the bank. If you get a check, you may want to do the same thing because you're going to have to group the checks together and go to the bank and deposit the banks. If it's a credit card, you're going to have to think about how the credit card company is grouping your sales and how the, those sales will then be grouped on your uh, bank statement so that you can line up your accounting system to match up with it uh, to match up so your bank recs will be fine. And then it's probably not going to be an, an electronic payment if you're getting the sales receipt, although you might be entering data directly from, you know, the bank transaction. Uh, and if it was an electronic payment and you're getting it from the bank, so if you're getting this information from the bank statement, then you already have it deposited. It's already basically in the bank statement. So in that case, you probably wouldn't want to use the undeposited funds because it is grouped in the same format that it would be in the bank statement, considering you got it from uh, the bank statement. Now, notice that you can't see the, the account that it's going into in terms of cash. The, the fact that it goes in the sales receipt means that it's going to be increasing a uh, cash type of account. But the default is undeposited funds. And where you could find that is you're going to go to the edit dropdown preferences. And when we went to this payments item here in the company preferences, we we turned on the use uh, use undeposited funds as the default deposit to account. So that's why it's going to be the default account going into undeposited funds. Now, if you want to see the options to do something other than undeposited funds, let's uncheck this. And you can do this now because this will actually give you an option within the data input screen that you will be able to see. So I'm going to say OK. And then when I do that, it's going to ask me to close all open windows. So I'll have to close everything. I'm going to open everything back up again. So I closed all the windows now and I couldn't record. I couldn't record my sales receipt. So I closed the sales receipt just to show you this. And so we're going to then go, if I go back into my company here and I go back into the home page, opening up the home page, I'm going to recreate my sales receipts now and just take a look at the change that happened. And now you have this item here, this drop down that says to deposit it in. Notice the default is still in undeposited funds, but you have your other accounts here that you can you can use as well. And the other account would mainly be the checking account. So if you if you turn the default back on, then this option won't be there, which you might want to be in place if you if you have someone else doing the data input and you want to kind of restrict them to always be using the undeposited funds because someone will probably see this default if they're if they're entering this and they're not aware of how the system will work and then they, they're going to say i should deposit it to, to the checking account and they might want to change that and if you're using the undeposited funds then that could mess things up so if you turn that default off they won't have that option to do so and, and won't you know make that mistake this data input point will not be there Okay, so let's go through this again. We're going to say this is going to be string music, which is now should be there. Undeposited funds. And we're going to say it's a cash transaction. I'm going to say this is as of uh, 011621. And it's going to create our sales numbers automatically. So I'm going to keep that as is. We have the sold to. We, we don't have the address there because we didn't add it. I'm not going to add a check number. And then the item that's going to be sold, this is going to be our inventory item. I'll hit the drop down. It's going to be an EPSH. So it's an Epiphone semi hollow body. And so I'm going to say, there it is. And let's make one of those. We're going to sell one of those. And there we have it. So now what's this going to do? It's a sales receipt. So it's going to be increasing some type of cash account. The cash accounts that's going to go into is undeposited fund by default, unless you change it. 
to like the checking account or something like that. And then it's going to be increasing by the 420. The other side will be sales. Sales, however, only increases by 400, the amount that we actually charged, not including the sales tax. The difference being the sales tax is going to increase the liability account. Then we we'll also have the inventory that's going to be going down by an amount not showing on the sales receipt as with the invoice, but driven by the sales receipt and known by QuickBooks through the item that we have set up, the Epiphone semi Halabati. The other side of that being cost of goods sold, the expense that will be increasing for us consuming the asset of inventory in order to generate the revenue of the $400. Let's check it out. We're going to say save and close and see if that is indeed what happens. I'm going to have to open my reports back up again because I closed them. So I'm going to go to the company and financial balance sheet. We're going to change the dates up top in the customized report. That's going to be from 010121 to 123121. And then I'm going to say OK. And then we see undeposited funds increasing here. So there's undeposited funds. It's going up by this 420. That's the full amount of the invoice, including the sales tax, closing that back out. Other side on the income statement or profit and loss, which we're going to have to open back up. But I'm going to close this first. I'm going to open that back up. We're going to go to the company and financial profit and loss, the standard P and L. That's going to be 010121 to 123121. And then we have our sales, double clicking on the sales. We have the $400 in the string music Epiphone. That's going to be the sales price, not including the sales tax. The difference of the sales tax, where does that go? Liability account, liability account. That's the, that's the money that the government makes us collect from the customer and give to them. So we're going to say there we have the sales tax, sales tax, $20. All right, that's increasing on the liability side. We're going to have to pay that next month to the government. And then we have the other side going down, which is inventory is going to be going down here by the 320. Now that 320, if I double click on it, it's not on the invoice. How does it, how does it, how does it know where that 320 comes from? Because we set up the item and we told it what the cost was when we set up the item so it can then record uh, the decrease in the inventory in a perpetual method in con alignment with the weighted average inventory method. Closing this back out, the other side is going to be on the profit and loss is going to be cost of goods sold. That's going to be the four, the 320, the cost of the inventory once again that we sold. Back to the balance sheet in the home in the open windows. Also note that we're going to have a sub ledger for the for the inventory because we sold inventory. If I go to the reports drop down, I go to the inventory. I want to take a look at the inventory valuation summary as of 123121. And we then see that we have our inventory valuation. We sold a semi hollow body. We don't have any more of those left. So we should probably buy some more because those seem to be kind of popular, more popopular than we thought. But in any case, we have 27,932 in the, this balance here. And that should tie out to the balance sheet right here, 27,932 as well. Let's try it again, this time with a service item. <clears throat> now, when we do a service, we sell a service, it's going to be easier. So what's going to happen when we sell a service? Like we're going to do like a diagnostic on the guitar, whatever. It sounds more like a car thing, but we're going to do a, a diagnostic on the guitar here. And that's going to be, uh, once we do that, it's going to be increasing the cash or undeposited funds again. And it's going to be increasing on the income statement side of things or the P&L the sales, but we don't have to deal with the inventory or sales tax, at least in the US typically for service items. So let's go back to the homepage and say, all right, let's do this again. And we're gonna say, let's say we have a diagnostic. So I'm gonna say a diagnostic. Di and, and again, that sounds more like a car kind of thing to me than a guitar kind of thing. But you know, <clears throat> it's a service, bear with me, it's a service on that. So, and we're gonna say this is non-taxable and it knows that already because that was in, that's what we set up the item to be. I'm gonna say 10 diagnostics here. So we're doing multiple diagnostics. And then we also are gonna say that we have hourly, hourly service one that we set up. And I'm gonna say we have, uh, let's say 15 of those. So I'm gonna have those two items on there. And so let's add a tuning, tuning support actually. And that's going to be, let's say, note when you're doing these service items, if you can standardize the way you do your billing on the service items, it'll be easier for you to then populate and do the recording of the service items. It'll be clearer to the clients oftentimes 
on what you're selling. This is often the case with like a bookkeeping service, or if you do something like, you know, guitar lessons or something like that, then it's, it's the more you can kind of standardize your billing process. A lot of times that's a better model than using what you would think would be the traditional model, which would be just charging your time. Because if you charge your time, it can be agonizing to try to figure out exactly what your time is that you spend on, on every single task. And then charging those out on an invoice process is time consuming in and of itself. If you're able to kind of group your stuff down into not by hour, but by what you do, it becomes a lot easier for like a bookkeeper. Obviously, oftentimes you charge in, in time, but you can look at the amount of transactions you have, for example, uh, in a particular in a particular range, you could say when I record this many transactions or provide this many reports within this range, that means I'm going to charge you a fixed amount for that range of transactions. And that'll be a lot easier to to record. And it doesn't matter if you have a good day or a bad day. It's not like you're going to overcharge somebody when you had a bad day and you just took a, you a long time to do something that's really easy. Or if you had a good day and you, you worked really quickly, you're going to charge someone less money and have inconsistency with, with the time that's being taken or, or the billable at rates that you might have for different people that are doing the work. So you can eliminate a lot of that if you can basically kind of standardize your billing process. So just something to think about on the on the billing side if you can move away from the hourly billing it kind of saves you some stress in my opinion oftentimes so in any case what's this going to do when we record it it's going to be increasing the undeposited funds the other side is going to be going into um, the revenue account different revenue account this time not sales but service revenue so let's check it out we're going to say save and close and then i'm going to go back to the balance sheet and we should have then an increase once again in undeposited funds. If I double click on that, there it is. There's the 5,180 double clicking on that. There's our sales receipt once again, uh, but I didn't charge it to a customer. I'm kind of surprised they, they allowed me to record it. It should be Sam. This is a new customer, Sam, the guitar man. That's going to be our new customer tab. I'm going to add, I'm going to quick add that up and it's going to, it's going to say switch between customers or customer tax codes. I'm going to say, okay. All right. I'm going to record this again with an actual customer involved. And I probably should have say that we're, we're going to say it's cash as well. And then I'm going to say save and close. Yes. So I adjusted that. Now we have an actual customer related to it, which is nice. And then I'm going to close this back out. And, uh, and so there's that side, the other side is going to be in the P and L profit and loss. And we're going to say that we have sales this time, not sales. Cause I'm indicating sales to be our merchandise sales. This is a service sale, double clicking the service sale. This, there is our, our three breakouts. Notice it's breaking out the same sales receipt, but it's giving us the line items of what we actually did that will help us to basically be able to track what we did by item as opposed to by sales receipt. But if I click on any one of these, I'll get to the same sales receipt with those three line items in it. Closing this back out, you can see that indicated here nicely by having the number two, the number of the sales receipt. Closing this back out. All right, so let's just review what we have if you're following along with the problem. Uh, this is what we have on the balance sheet. So you can just check your numbers here. Obviously, we're racking up a lot in the undeposited funds. You would typically want to deposit them, you know, nightly or something like that. But we want to show these things grouping the problem together. So that's why we're going to try to group the sales type of things together. And then we'll do the deposits all, you know, kind of grouped together. But obviously, in practice, you'd want to do that every night or something like that. And okay, and so then I'm going to go to the profit and loss. Here's the P&L that you could check out if you're following along there. Let's go to the trial balance just to see the trial balance because I think that's an easier thing to look at when checking the numbers. And that's going to be 010121 uh, to 123121 on the date range. So here's the numbers on the trial balance.